I want to be in prayer for Delana Stevens. She's having her tonsils out. She's in the back. But if you see her, let her know you'll be praying for her. Her daddy needs to get her some ice cream and because uh, that's always good. Acts chapter 16 today. Um, we've been looking at Paul and Silas's second missionary journey. Paul's second journey, Silas's first journey with him. We're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 25. You know, my late father had a great passion for prison ministry. In fact, um, for 17 years in the latter time of his life before he, his Alzheimer's did not allow him to do so, he would be in local prisons at least four days every month. He had a great desire to carry out that ministry. It was a blessing uh, when Pastor Willie passed a few weeks ago, Tommy Armstrong, who's chaplain, local prison at contacted me and he said, Rick, the inmates are still talking about your dad. My dad had passed away eight years ago. Um, I have had the privilege of visiting in uh, prison, visiting groups and visiting individuals, not to the extent of my father, but it, it's not unusual in the prison to hear accounts of inmates who come to know the Lord through the ministry of outside persons or outside groups that happens. In fact, it's not unusual to hear of inmates who come to a saving faith in the Lord as they're there in prison through the ministry of other inmates. Uh, my friend Lorenzo was greatly impacted by Brother White, who uh, last I heard was at Lawrenceville Correctional Center. Brother White was a godly man. He was a trustee, man. He could have a few more freedoms than the others could. He took pictures and God was all over him. When you saw him, he was about my age and a mentor to a lot of guys who were younger. So it isn't unusual to see one inmate impact another inmate. But through my dad's ministry and my own, what is highly unusual is the conversion of an employee of the State Department of Corrections through the ministry of an inmate. That doesn't usually happen. I don't know. I'm sure at some point it has, but it, it, it's highly unusual. Yet today, we're going to see in our text that very thing, that a jailer, a man given responsibility to keep these people uh, secure and keep people secure from them is led to faith through the ministry of a prisoner. And it happened as a result of an earthquake. And it happened also as a result of people who were free actually coming back and resubmitting themselves to being incarcerated again. I want to look at Acts chapter 16, if you would, with me today in beginning in verse 25. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. In other words, he knew he would lose his life if he lost these prisoners. He said, I'll just take care of it myself. Verse 28, but Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them in the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. Let's pray. Well, as we look to your word today, uh, we thank you for it. And uh, we thank you for these accounts in the book of Acts where we see in the early church people who were on fire for you, even in the midst of difficulty, who were witnesses for you and how we see the salvation of individuals. And Father, we know that you're still in that work. 
We pray that you would use this church and us as individuals to be vehicles of your grace to others. And we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we know the context of this as we looked last week. Uh, uh, Paul and Silas had done a great work. They had exercised a demon from a servant girl. But as a result of that, the servant girl who had made lots of money for her owners was no longer able to do so. That got Paul and them in trouble with the owners. The owners drummed up these false charges against Paul and his company. And as a result of that, uh, they're in prison. And so we see as they're there and uh, they're in chains, uh, they're bound, uh, they're behind bars. We see in this context what I believe is the key verse uh, that I want to look at this morning. And it's found in verse 30. After uh, they had the potential to be free and resubmitted themselves under this jailer, the jailer asked this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now I have a question, actually a couple of questions this morning. What was the impetus for this question? What, what prodded this man to ask this question? Restated, what was it that, at, that led this man to ask this particular question, what must I do to be saved? In effect, what the jailer is saying is this, what you guys have, I want. He saw something different in them. And I want to look at three things briefly this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion. And we prepare our hearts for the greatest sacrifice ever given, the, the life of Jesus Christ on the cross, the once for all sacrifice. But I want you to see with me today that it's a model for us as Christians. I want to look at three things that were true of Paul and Silas that led this man to ask this question. And the first was this, Paul and Silas had a joyful attitude in adversity. They had a joyful attitude in a very difficult time. Have you ever had a bad day? I have. Of course, all of us have. I was reading this past week at some funny things. They said, you know it's a bad day when your twin sister forgets your birthday. That's a bad day. <laughs> you know it's a bad day when you call your wife at home from work and you say you want to eat out tonight and you arrive home to a sandwich on the porch. <laughs> you know it's a bad day when your car horn sticks and you happen to be at a stoplight behind a motorcycle gang, that's not a good thing. And it's a bad day when you find a really good coupon and then realize that it had expired yesterday. Those things are bad, and I've never had a sandwich left on the porch for me to eat out. They're bad, but they can't compare to what Paul and Silas had been through. I mean, follow, let, let's rehearse what we looked at last week. They did a good act. They delivered a woman who was possessed by a demon. And then as a result of that, they were objects of lies and misrepresentation. Uh, the mob turned against them. They were beaten with rods. Now, if it had been under Jewish law, there would have been 40 minus 1. There would have been a limitation, but there really was no limitation here. And then follow this. They were thrown in jail and put in stocks. Now imagine if your back was raw from having been beaten and they put you in a jail. And not only that, they put you and everyone with you in stock. So nobody has the freedom even to put any salve, any type of relief on your back. It was a bad day. It was a terrible day, a suffering day. But notice what they did in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were doing what? They were praying and singing hymns to God. It was about midnight. It had been a long day and, and it would have been easy for them to have just gone to sleep to try to get some relief. It would have been easy for them to have complained, but they were singing hymns to God. They were mistreated, misrepresented, beaten badly, restricted in the stocks, and they were praising God. And guess who was watching? The jailer. The jailer was observing. And if you're a Christian today, People are observing your life. They should see something different. They shouldn't see what they see on the television or what they see in the marketplace from everyone else. They should see something different. People are observing us, how we act, 
how we handle adversity, what we do when the pressure is turned on us. I believe in part, at least in part, that what drove this man to ask the question was he saw something different in these men's lifestyle. They were different. They were distinct. They didn't respond the way most people did. You know, we're called to be a lifestyle witness. Now, we're called to verbally witness, but our lifestyle should match our words. First Peter 3 and verses 1 and 2, uh, God was speaking through Peter to wives at that time, wives whose husbands had no regard for God, no, no use for God, and, and instead of saying, complain and nag your husband to come to church, he said, live pure and reverent lives, live submissive lives, and, and he speaks of the power of a lifestyle witness. He says, because by doing it, you can win your husband without a word. Rather than nagging, as, as you pray, as you demonstrate a Christ-like life, you can impact your loved one. That's what it says. In Luke 23 and verse 41, a very familiar passage. Jesus was on the cross between the two criminals. And you remember, uh, people were mocking, but one criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had a change of heart. But you remember as the other criminal was mocking Jesus and speaking negatively about him, what did he say? The, the, the one who sa was saved said this, we're punished justly because we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has what? Done nothing wrong. He looked at Jesus' life and he saw that there was a difference. So in both of these instances, what, what Peter prescribes on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 3 for wives, what, what that criminal saw in, in the life of Jesus tells us this, that a Christian's life has the potential to have an impact on someone who doesn't believe. And here in Acts chapter 16, the jailer saw something different in how Paul and Silas and their company handled adversity. And that led him to think, I want what they have. But I want you to see a second truth. And it was this that led to this man knowing what to ask. Paul and Silas communicated truth verbally. Now look at verse 31 and 32. We see the culmination of it. The, the man fell down before Paul and Silas. He saw how much they loved him, the sacrifice, and, and how he had never seen anything like this before, that someone would resubmit himself and themselves to go back into prison. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And after that question, we see Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household and did what? And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. It wasn't that he could make a decision for his own house. Uh, a husband can't make a decision for a wife, a wife for a husband, a parent for a child. Every one of us has to make his or her only decision. And it's between that individual and the Lord. So the word was spoken to all of these. So we see that after he asked, what must I do to be saved? We see Paul was very ready and clearly able to share the gospel. But I appeal to you that was not the only time there was a verbal witness. It was the most complete time, but there are actually two aspects of a verbal witness. I believe verse 25 is where it began. They were praying and they were singing hymns to God. Now, did they go through the whole plan of salvation? No, they did not. But they were making clear that they believed in God through their language. You know, we're preparing to observe communion in just a few moments. And one of the funniest uh, things I probably have ever said or done happened before a communion service. I said, uh, Vicki at that time was playing the piano. I said, she's going to play silently. I meant to say quietly. A piano does not play silently, all right? If it's silent, it's not being played. They heard the noise. They heard the words. It says the prisoners were listening to them as they were verbally speaking praise to God. And I don't think it's a stretch to believe that this jailer also was listening. And he heard enough to get his bearings. He heard enough to say, 
These people are different. I see it in how they're acting, but I hear in their songs that there's a God that they serve. And the question I have for you today, is Jesus in your vocabulary at school, at work? Is he on your lips in the marketplace? Would people know that you're a follower by your speech, that you're a follower of Jesus? Listen to Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how you answer each person. Their speech, their speech was seasoned with grace. And, and this man noticed a difference. But I want you to see a third thing. Paul and Silas showed genuine concern for this man's life. They cared about him. They deeply cared about him. You know, in verses 26 through 29, we see something truly amazing. Amazing not in the same way of the exorcism we saw last week of the demon that was taken out of the servant girl, but something just as powerful. It's a different kind of amazing. We see that God sent an earthquake. The jail shook, the doors opened, the chains came loose. The jailer awakened and he was distressed. And Paul shouted as he was preparing to go out into freedom, don't harm yourself, we're coming back in. Now who would do that? Paul did it. Why? Because Paul cared more about this jailer's well-being than he did his own freedom. You know, there are two accompanying truths that we get from this narrative today. And the first is this, people matter to God. That person that frustrates you at work matters to God. That, that relative, that distant relative who you try to avoid so often matters to God. And, and the second truth that accompanies that is not only do people matter to God, but people need to know that they matter to God. See, it's one thing for someone to matter to God. There are many people that live this world that, that they matter to God, but they don't know it. They need to know that they matter to God. How do they know it? Through you and me, through us sharing the gospel, through us being concerned about their lives, taking the time uh, that needs to happen. Now, let's follow the narrative here. First, the jailer sees these men, Paul and Silas, and, and they're going, they're beaten, they're in the stocks, and they're singing praises. He sees a difference in their lifestyle. Then through what is communicated and he is audibly able to receive, he's able to put together that it must be about Jesus. It must be about salvation. And then finally and critically, he sees that against all tendency towards self-preservation that Paul and Silas could have had, they forsook all of that because they cared for him. And those three things led this man to say this, where do I sign up? I want what you have. You know, servant evangelism is an effective type of evangelism. There's mass evangelism. We're, we're going to be having in the Farmville area, in the Appomattox area, in this calendar year, outdoor revivals. Actually, the one in Farmville is going to be a crusade, an evangelistic crusade that's going to be coming in 2024. There are mass evangelists. There's personal evangelism where you sit down with someone and you communicate the gospel and that person comes. But there's also servant evangelism that often accompanies the communication of the gospel. And it's one of the most effective ways that we can witness to others. Years ago, I heard the story of a man who had no desire for any church, any fellowship, or anything. His wife was a believer in the Lord. She went to church, but for the husband, he had no part of that. He did not like the people. He did not want to be associated with this particular church or any church for that matter. Well, his wife, who he dearly loved, 
became gravely ill, so ill that she could not care for him or the family. And the ladies in that church began to come in the home and they fixed meals and, and prepared things. They did the wash. They would take the wash and wash and dry it. The men knew that he needed to spend time with his wife, so they took care of the yard. Well, miraculously, the man's wife recovered and she went back to church and to her great joy and surprise, her husband said, I want to go with you. And so he went to church. The preacher preached. He responded after the preacher preached. He came forward and said, I want to be saved just like this man, a desire. I want what you guys have. The preacher preached the message, presented the man before the church, prepared for what would be in a few weeks, the baptism, went down into his office afterward, put that message away and said, boy, this is a great message. This guy got saved as a result of that message. Now, it didn't start there. It started outside of the walls of the church of people who cared about that man. I wonder today, do we have that heart for people? Do we have it? Paul and Silas had it for the jailer, and the jailer knew that they cared. He knew that they cared. And so we see that he got saved. But I want you to see a pattern that we've already seen with Lydia because it's very important. This man accepted Christ. He believed, and there are two things, just like Lydia. I mean, it's a, a, a replica of what we saw with Lydia. He accepted the Lord when the word was preached to him, and he and his family, they were baptized. Baptism is a public way of saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I identify with him. But I want you to see the second thing, and this often we overlook in the church. He immediately also began to serve. Remember Lydia, when she got saved, she was baptized, and then she said, hey, I have this home. I want to open the home to you. Let me minister to you. She immediately began to minister. Well, look at what happened here in verse 33. This jailer, a new believer, took them the same hour of the night, and washed their wounds. These men who had no hands free even to help themselves earlier, he washed them, and right away they were baptized. Verse 34, he brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. What did he do? He served. And if we're Christians, we need to serve. We need to find God. What can I bring to the table? How can I serve others for your glory? So this jailhouse conversion was unique in that we see the jail keeper was led to the Lord through the inmate, that an earthquake happened, that not only did the earthquake happen, but once the people were free, they came back in. But in spite of all the miraculous, I want you to see what was true of these men. They responded rightly in hardship. Their lifestyle demonstrated genuine faith. In the Lord. The Lord was on their lips, so this man knew what to ask. At least he was in the ballpark to figure out that he needed to get saved. And they demonstrated a total concern, a sacrificial concern for this man. And so it shouldn't surprise us that this man came to be a follower of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we have looked today at this account from uh, the book of Acts, um, we thank you, Lord, for what you teach us from it. That, Father, as Christians, people are observing us. And, Father, we don't need to put on airs or pretend to be self-righteous or super people. But, Lord, we do need to be people of faith and that that faith is clear in how we live. Father, help us to have Jesus on our lips that even if we don't have the opportunity in the workplace at first to share a clear plan of salvation that at least people can have their bearing spiritually and understand that there is a Lord who loved them. And Father, help us to be reminded that people matter to God and because they matter to you, Lord, they should matter to us. Father, we know they matter, but they need to see that they matter. And so, Father, as we prepare to partake from this table, we do so with great appreciation of your sacrifice for us 
And we do so in Jesus' name.